I'm joined now by Leader McConnell. Good morning, Leader. Welcome. Merry Christmas to you. Good morning, Hugh. Merry Christmas to you as well. We have not forgotten Mayfield or the surrounding areas on the Hugh Hewitt Show. How is the rebuilding and the relief effort going? I think the relief effort uh, is going very well. Uh, the, the, the problem in all of these situations where you get hit by a tornado or have any other catastrophe is when the, after about a month, people still got a lot of problems and they uh, are worried that they're going to be forgotten. So we're going to stick with them until we get Mayfield rebuilt and uh, get it back uh, back to normal. Uh, same for Dawson Springs. Um, worst tornado we've had in terms of loss of life, uh, probably in our history. Yeah, it was it was devastating. I'm glad to hear the focus will continue. It helps that the GOP leader is from Kentucky. Senator, you served with Senator Jim Jeffords, the late Jim Jeffords of Vermont. He was a three-term senator. You served with him his entire three terms. Did his jump from parties in the spring of twenty uh, of twenty thousand and one surprise you when it happened? Well, he was very, very uncomfortable on our side, uh, and Vermont, of course, had become what it is today—a very, very liberal place. It was a shock, um, but not a total surprise. Now, I don't believe he had been publicly abused in the way that left-wing progressives are publicly abusing Joe Manchin, was he? I mean, it was a quiet disagreement with President Bush over, I think, special education funding that was the last straw. But, but no, one, no one abused Jim Jeffords. No, no. Everybody on our side was courting him because we were always fearful he'd do exactly what he ended up doing. So, uh, no, I mean, we certainly didn't do anything like the White House did to Joe Manchin. Uh, the other day, basically calling him a, a, a liar. Uh, it was it was astonishing. Um, usually when you've got uh, a member who's a little bit out of sync with everybody else, you give them a lot of love. They did exactly the opposite. Have you spoken with him or written to him about whether or not he might want to cross the aisle like Winston Churchill and Jim Jeffords did? Well... Uh, you know, as I've said the last couple of days, I've had this conversation with him off and on for a, a couple of years. Uh, we come from states that have a lot in common, that have become increasingly red over the last uh, decade or so. And I think what I imagine it's discovering is that there just aren't any Democrats left in the Senate that are uh, pro-life and terribly concerned about uh, debt and deficit and, in, and inflation. So he, he feels like a man alone. Uh, if he were to join us, he'd be joining a lot of uh, folks who have similar views on a whole range of issues. He'd also, would he get to keep his chairmanship of energy? He, energy is a big deal for West Virginia. He's chairman right now. If he switched over, would the gavel stay in his hands? That's something we talked to him about. Uh, obviously, he, I'm sure enjoys being a chair of the committee. It's important to West Virginia and all of those things are things we discuss. So let me turn to hard infrastructure. I love your spinach and sugar analogy. I saw I used it with my friend Guy Benson the other day. I want people to hear that as well. The hard infrastructure bill that you helped pass, Rob Portman, Susan Collins, 17 Republicans, and I agreed with it. It it meant a lot in terms of what it's going to get done, but it also meant a lot in the politics of getting Build Back Better killed. Can you explain that to people? Yeah, I mean, initially the Democrats knew, the poll data was clear, what was popular was hard infrastructure. Seventy-five percent of people believed uh, that we needed to do a deal with deteriorating roads and bridges and uh, expand broadband. That was the popular part. And so I liked the approach in the Senate of putting together a bipartisan group. Uh, the president ended up, ended up agreeing with that to deal with the popular part of it, uh, which I d described as the sugar, leaving the Democrats to see if they could pass the spinach. And as we ended the year, it looks to me like they couldn't swallow the spinach. Now, I'm, I know Schumer said last night on a call he's not giving up. I don't expect him to. But the worst of BBB, it appears to me, is... 
It does to me as well. And congratulations on that. It's uh, it was great strategery, as former President Bush liked to say. I want to turn to uh, to senators. They have different career paths. Uh, some are looking down the street at sixteen hundred, and some are looking at Mitch McConnell and want to be leader someday. John Thune's actually been in both positions. I read a story that got me upset that John Thune might be thinking of retiring. How do you say say it ain't so, Joe, in South Dakota, Leader McConnell? Well, John Thune is an outstanding senator. He's done a great job as uh, whip, which is our number two position in the Senate. Uh, it would be a real setback for the country and for our party if he retires, and I certainly hope he won't. Let me ask you a little inside baseball here, Leader McConnell. Uh, you respected the blue slip rule for district courts. If you didn't have both blue slips for a district court nominee, that nominee did not get a hearing. Is Chuck Schumer respecting the blue slip rule for district courts? He, he is, and I think that's the right thing to do. That's been a strong Senate tradition over the years. And so, um, <clears throat> and, and we honored the blue slip, as you indicated, at the district court level uh, during the Obama years. So uh, last, the Trump year. yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Now, let me talk to you about uh, real inside baseball reconciliation. The budget last year passed by Bernie Sanders allowed for reconciliation to pass with the majority. That's what BBB needed and did not get. I don't know how long that stays in effect, and I know there'll be another budget, or I expect there will be another budget. When the window is either open or reopens again, they get a second bite at the apple. Which tax provisions, all of them ruinous, do they seem most attached to bringing back from the dead because Americans have got to plan? Well, they've still got this vehicle. And Schumer announced last night, according to what I read this morning, that they're going to continue to try to find some version of it that will appeal to Senator Manchin and, and Senator Cinema. And also they're continuing this fixation with what I call the democratic big lie that states are involved in changing their voting laws to make it more difficult for people to vote. That's just simply not happening. What's really going on is the Democrats want to take over the way we conduct all of our elections in this country. In other words, federalize how we do all elections. And we've avoided that throughout the history of our country. You know, each state ought to craft its own election rules, with one exception, the Voting Rights Act. It's against the law to discriminate against people in the voting process on the basis of race. No one is doing that. Uh, if they do, it's against the law and can be uh, prosecuted. Uh, there is no rationale for the federal takeover of elections other than the Democrats want to make it easier to cheat, frankly. They want to make sure states can't have photo ID at the polls. They want to guarantee that states can have what's called ballot harvesting. That's where you run around and pick up other people's votes for them and and turn them in. Uh, they don't want even the, the, the most modest uh, security measures that guarantee that each of us only have one vote. So that's what we'll also be confronting. Once again, we've shot down several versions of it earlier this year, and it appears as if we'll be dealing with that again. Uh, Leader, do you think that stepped-up basis, which the Democrats wanted to repeal uh, and drop that, is sufficiently radioactive that it will not be resurrected next year? Yeah, I think it's dead. It didn't didn't even make it into the House pass version, which is close to total monstrosity. All right, let me ask you about... uh, Senator Manchin, and I listened very closely when he was on Fox News Sunday with Brett Baer on Sunday. In fact, I taped it and listened to it twice. It seems to me the filibuster is safe, uh, even though he is continuing to talk about how to get what he thinks are good improvements in voting rights passed. And I believe Senator Sinema has has restated her opposition to filibuster change. Do you believe the filibuster is safe for the rest of this Congress? Uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema has been unequivocal in support of the filibuster. For your listeners, that prevents radicalism. The reason the Democrats want to get rid of the filibuster is they want to admit two new states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, and pack the Supreme Court and fundamentally change the structure of America forever. Filibuster prevents extremism. 
It's always frustrating when you're in the majority and wish you could do everything you wanted to. The Senate was designed to make it difficult to have radical change in the country unless there are huge majorities on one side or the other. So it is the essence of the Senate is the legislative filibuster, and I admire and respect Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin for saying they are not changing it. Let me move abroad in my last two questions, uh, Senator McConnell. Earlier today, one of your colleagues sent me uh, a pointer to a, uh, a line of, of thinking online that Putin is committed to the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and that's a terrible thing. When it happens, does the United States have the equivalent of little green men, either little green cyber experts or little green F-35s that we can help Ukraine with? Well, let, let me say what we ought to do is give the Ukrainians the ability to, to fight. Uh, there's some people in the State Department, I think, in this administration and maybe in the previous one, who felt giving the Ukrainians the ability to fight is somehow provocative to the Russians. Uh, I would give them uh, equipment that allows them to take it to the Russians if the Russians invaded. Second, I would encourage increase military personnel uh, from NATO in Poland and in the Baltics, not only our own troops, but troops from other NATO countries. So because countries like Poland and the Baltics have had a a lot of bad experience with the the Russians going back a long time and are extremely nervous about this. I hear the Ukrainians are ready to fight, and if they're ready to fight, we should make it a fair fight by trying to help them defend themselves. Uh, and and would that extend, in your view, to assets which are not officially the United States, but which are made available to them that are, especially the cyber, I, I'd like to see them blink out Soviet, uh, Russian nuclear power plants and blink out Russian energy plants and make it very cold in Russia. And the Ukrainians have a pretty healthy cyber sector. Do you think they can do that with or without assistance? Look, there are a number of tactics that we could employ, uh, and, and among them are some of the things you suggested. Uh, I, I hope and I expect the president's made it clear to Putin that that's a, a possibility as well. Leader McConnell, I appreciate your time. Have a Merry Christmas. Our best wishes to the people of Mayfield and the surrounding communities, and I look forward to talking to you in 2021. Well done. Uh, Well played, Mr. Bond, as they say, on the uh, Better Build Back Better fiasco. Uh, It's dead, and I hope it stays in the grave. Great, Hugh. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you as well. Thank you, sir.